and girls hey are live with the weather report for monday january 10th 2022 and we have jackson wheat today oh a very special guest yes oh, somebody from somebody from a big channel <laughs> <laughs> anyway uh, i tell you what his content is is extraordinary i love this series of from the ancestors tale that uh, you've been doing, Jackson. Oh, thank you. Yeah, very good it. stuff. All your stuff's very well put together, and you, you must make a, a hell of a teacher because you manage to put together stuff in a very logical, nice um, manner that flows. It's entertaining. It you know it doesn't doesn't catch. It. Your your stuff is really good. You make well, me want to quit even oh, before well. I. Get I, I mean, you know, it's not just me. I have people who also work on things with me behind the scenes and help edit my scripts and all that fun stuff so that when it comes out, it's, you know, the best it can be. It really um, is good. Yeah. And, of course, I'm a, a, a visual learner. I got to see pictures. I can't just have it heard. You know, I really like seeing this is here's a diagram of how this thing works. And it's like, oh, OK, yes. that makes sense. Yeah. I'm yeah, try to do I try that with to the students pictures. too. I try to draw pictures, but I just confuse myself. <laughs> I don't know. Anyway, so you did one eight days ago, the chimpanzee's tail was the latest one, right? Yes, the, the bonobo's tail is next. Okay. I'm going to link your uh, your channel in the description. I am um, uh, one of the labs I TA is is botany. And so botany is, is weird in that um, we are very used to, you know, seeing animals, whether it's you know, something as simple as a sponge or jellyfish or what have you. And, and so thinking about plants is really weird. Um, yeah. And so I found that like drawing phylogenies for students really helps them get a grasp on why plants do the things that they do, you know? Yeah. Plants are fascinating to me in another respect, respect in, in that they basically go through embryogenesis throughout their entire life, like when they yeah. create a new leaf or whatever. Yeah, right. Yeah, because they're they um, we plants are sort of along a spectrum. You have like protists, which are haploid almost their entire lives, and then animals, like all of them, are diploid almost our entire lives. Plants right. sort of split it. There are some plants which are haploid for most of their lives and then diploid for a part of it. And then they get like, pro they progressively elongate the diploid stage until you get like the, you know, trees and flowers and things where it's almost entirely diploid with a little section haploid. And I think that's also really cool. That's something we should definitely discuss more like the evolution of, of life cycles, uh, you know, in plants. Cause it's really yeah. neat. Yeah, and another remarkable thing about plants is if you look at some of the some of the uh, specialized chemicals that each plant has, like terpenes, mm -hmm. whatever, you will find all kinds of traces of things that are that are uh, are not homochiral, uh, and you, you you'll find all sorts of really odd chemical composition that I think is almost a fossil record of abiogenesis going way back that the early you know when plants split off from animals i think there was a there were a hell of a lot more different biologically active compounds than there are now you know i think we're narrowing it down slowly mm. you know what i mean like, okay 
Yeah, like, and, and I became fascinated with that when I was like uh, 10, 11 years old. I used to go out, the, go out in the woods and I would smell different plants and notice the ones that smelled the same. And then when I started looking into the chemistry of, of why things smell and taste the way they do, there's all these remarkable little off off compounds, right, that are, mm -hmm. that are just somewhat, well, alkaloids and some really strange things and medicines that we use that are just, you know, bizarre. And animals don't right. seem to have quite as much of that. Of course, animals seem to do it with proteins. You know, they seem to do their chemistry with proteins, but plants have a lot of weird compounds in them. Oh, yeah. And, and you know, a lot of times they're, they're species specific. So they target like one specific species of bee or wasp or fly or right. beetle or something like that. And so this, this little cocktail of, of, of volatile compounds is tailored just to that one species. Yep. It's pretty cool. Yeah, absolutely. So the first thing I linked is Nathaniel Jensen ha is, has a new book coming out in uh, where he shows us how we all came from Noah in uh, March 1st, I think is when it's actually coming out. And I'm sure that I'm sure that it will be uh, strong in making claims and completely lacking in showing the backup data that he used to derive these claims from. It's really yeah, hard to yeah. get from this guy <laughs> yeah the the kindle is going is like 9.99 it comes out on the first of march and then the hard copy i think comes out on the 15th yep of march <clears throat> and one one of the claims is that today's native americans descend from central asians who arrived in the early ad era and i think he said on answers in genesis in one of his videos <laughs> He claims that the Romans chased the Native Americans out of Asia in 400 AD. Amazing. And then they they swam across the Bering Strait. <laughs> in the... Uh, yeah, 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 there, yeah. Yeah. <laughs> well, there's those canoes, you know, they have canoes. Yeah. Okay, yeah, birch bark canoes. Uh, <laughs> to be... Anyway, forget, forget that I said that. But... Uh, and then they populated the entire, you know, North and South America in, uh, what, uh, 1600 years? Or five, yeah, that fast. Fast. Yeah. And built some pretty stress, impressive structure. No, before, okay, when did the, the Spaniards get there in, in 1400? Like four, 14 yeah. or 1500. So almost 1500, like in, yeah. 1,000 years to sprint across all of the Americas and build mm -hmm. civilizations down in South America. I don't think so, Nathaniel. I don't yeah, know. And then, of course, they had to develop the cultures that would say, I want to build this stuff. Right. And you have all these different cultures and different ex expressions of those cultures. And, and the yeah. fact that I can't remember the name of the, of the, the find, but th they found that ancient skeleton that they went to court over, and eventually they had to give it back to the um, indigenous peoples of North America. But um, it dated back to like 11,000 years old, yet it still yeah. had the same um, genetics as modern um, indigenous Americans. <clears throat> so the Romans, as I recall, were not around 11,000 years ago, unless they invented time machines, which they very well may have, but I kind of doubt it. <clears throat> What was the population of North and South America in 1400, I wonder? Ooh. Well, and, uh, uh, let's be specific. In 1491, you mean? <laughs> yeah. Uh, yeah. <laughs> what was the population? Uh, I, don't, I don't know. I've, I know I've read estimates, but I, I can't recall uh, any real number. I'm sure some of our very intelligent side chatters uh, and uh, what we call our, our – lovingly, we call our uh, – Storm chasers might be able to find us a date or okay, a population. 100, 112 million. So they oh, there we go. There we go. Okay. So they swam across in about 20 million of them probably swam across in 400 AD. And then they, how long does it take to run from Alaska to the tip of South America? <laughs> <laughs> a little while. Well, probably. You run every day. <clears throat> you, know, you have those uh, long distance runners, you know, who'll yeah. do 
a hundred or 150 mile races, you know, they, they run X number of hours and then rest a little while. And then. Yeah. I'm sure they could pull it off in 10 or 20 years, but and all yeah. along the way, they would have to be multiplying and creating civilizations. And so what right. the hell is it? Setting I got up listen. trade networks and all that sort right. of stuff. I got to listen to that video. Uh, let's see. Where, where was it? I think I had a link somewhere. Genetic equivalence. Uh, what is that one? I don't know. Uh, oh, here's James Tour. Yeah, James Tour did his nine-hour compilation of all of his Dr. Dave videos, and here's his structure of phospholipids. And he's he kind of ex explains it, and then he explains why it can't work in you know a number of different ways. And he says that he seems to think that uh, phosphatidyl ethanol ethanolamine was the only one i don't know if he actually he didn't actually say that but he kind of implied it but but that's not the case there are other hit groups on phosphates but nobody knows what the fuck i'm talking about so I'll shut up now but anyway and then he goes on uh, a whole bunch of stuff about oh how the proteins and the ion channels have to be just right and everything has to be there and stuff anyway but i've been looking into membranes pretty seriously for the last few months and the plot is thicker than you think. That's oh yeah, no, it's ridiculous. If you, I took a um, cell biology class over the summer, which was a terrible idea, but you discuss uh, a number of different um, phospholipids, yeah, which are all involved in the, in the membrane. Like, uh, was it phosphatidylcholine and all that sort of fun stuff? Phosphatidyl and acetyl, phosphatidyl ethan ethanolamine. Yeah, and, and I, I don't. Yeah. I don't miss any of that. <laughs> don't you? I love it. I just love it. And then, uh, oh, and then of course we have other things that end up in that membrane, like cholesterol, which tends to stiffen membranes, particularly right. animal, animals. And then, and then on top you've got these proteins. Well, you've got proteins that glue themselves to the inner part of the uh, cell membrane. You have some that glue themselves to the outside of the cell, and then you have other ones that are embedded inside or pass all the way through the membrane. So you got four different kinds of proteins, basically. And then on top, like on the outside of the cell, you've got all of these uh, proteo, they're called proteoglycans, where they have all these sugars that attach to proteins, and they create this amazing code that has a whole lot to do with how viruses recognize things. And we and uh, your immune system recognizes vi viruses. Mm. So there's this so your your cells are basically sticky with sugar on the outside mm. and and then and then from there you start looking at how the uh the uh the, the uh like the actin and the the filaments inside the cell end up not only shaping the cell into the shape it should be you know like blood cells have that little little divot in the middle uh and you know every cell has its own shape because of these cytoskeletons and it it's just some incredible chemistry involved in that. Yeah, absolutely. And uh, it, it's absolutely amazing. But you got proteoglycans. And, uh, of course, they're made from glycosaminoglycans, which is a gag. Glycosamino, yeah, glycosaminoglycans. Mm. It's fun to say. And, it's, you know, what's really fun to say is phosphatidyl and acetal. <laughs> I mean, if you're just sitting around and you have nothing to do, just start saying that shit. It's fun. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I read. I was reading about um, like uh, uh, bacterial cell walls not too long ago, and there's all those different uh, compounds too, which are or which make up the the cell wall. And you also yeah. have plants who have their you know their own chemistry for their cell wall, and uh, fungi yep. and and archaeans, all these different organisms which have different cell membranes and cell walls, and using different chemicals for all that. Yeah, that is some cool stuff. Very yeah, cool. absolutely. Anyway. Okay, uh, Jackson, you have a question from Andrew. <clears throat> okay. What are your thoughts on the existence of junk DNA and its use in molecular phylogenies? Well, I mean, junk DNA exists, um, and its use in molecular phylogenies. Well, if very, you have... Very yeah, I mean, yeah, if you have some uh, unique inserts in a genome like uh, endogenous retroviruses or um, 
things like that, where the odds that you're going to get some particular insertion at a particular location is vanishingly small. And so you, know, you see a set of organisms who have this one, and then a smaller set have that one plus another one. Well, then that seems logical that that would be a, a cluster within the larger uh, cluster. And so, yeah, you can do. And that's uh, one of the ways that, you know, you can show that humans are primates, for instance, is we have, we share a set of ERVs with chimps. And then uh, we share ERVs with like orangutans and gorillas and gibbons. So, yeah, it's, they are very useful. Yeah, and the great part about it is they're less conserved, so they're going to give you. But then uh, that's a double-edged sword because they're, they're less conserved. So looking back in the recent past, like 60 million or 100 million years, uh, it's going to give you a signal, right? Because mm -hmm. right. you can see how they diverge. But if you go any further than that, the signal gets a little fuzzy uh, because mm -hmm. because they're not, not as conserved. But. But yeah, we were talking about junk DNA the other day, and it, it really is kind of a bad idea to call it junk DNA because. Well, I understand why it was called. Well, so there, I, I understand. Yes, there it can be problematic with that terminology, but I also understand why they why they use the term junk because junk, at least to the original, um, uh, researchers was like. Yes, some of it's not useful. It's like if you think of the junk in your attic, yeah, sure, some of it you're yeah. not going to use, but some of it could be useful under certain contexts. And that the the problem is, though, it's in popular media, the representation was if it's junk, it has no function at all, which no, function like, at all. no, 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 that's not what they meant originally. And uh, actually, uh, Tony Reed of uh, How Creationism Taught Me Real Science did a really good video on junk DNA uh, a while back. So I recommend yeah, that I've, got, I've got a giant five stall garage. Well, you can only fit three cars in there, but there's room for two more up front. And and above it is is just packed with my junk. And mm -hmm. I would kill anybody that tried to throw my junk away. Right. I mean, <laughs> because I'm going to use that stuff someday, right? Like right. I, I've got two Keurig coffee pots up, up there that, you know, and, and just, I mean, everything I need to start civilization over. You know. Right. I mean, some of that, you know, turned out to be like uh, regulatory genes. Uh, some of it turned out to be and, you know, a lot of it did turn out to be useless stuff um, or, you know, broken pseudo genes. Uh, we were talking about lines and signs earlier or ERVs, things like that. Um, so, yeah, a lot of it is probably not used. And there's there's a like population genetics math that goes into figuring out that uh, probably how much of it isn't used and yeah and all that sort of stuff and so yeah, yeah and like we, were useful. we were talking about signs which are uh sh short interspersed nuclear nuclear elements mm -hmm. uh they they tend to attach at certain certain spots in the genome uh overwhelmingly and those things actually help to structure the uh true chromatin and the basically unused chromatin mm -hmm. in the in the nucleus so they actually help. They help structure that uh, uh, 4D nu 4D nucleome, you know, the structure right. chromosomes. And signs apparently have something to do with that, because they're on the boundaries of those things, and they have to do with epigenetics. And but it's not because they have specific information in them that's useful. It's because it's because of a whole lot of really complicated chemistry and math that they right. have an effect on on things. Sure. Um, and interestingly, some of those uh, bits that that were lost uh, evolutionarily early on or earlier in the evolution of some lineage um, came to be reused later. They were repurposed for some yeah. other function later. Like, uh, and that's what happened with some ERVs. Like, um, there was one that uh, I think was infected, like the ancestor of all vertebrates. Um, but, but uh, yeah, but that it's used in in most mammals. As a as a placental protein, and yeah. uh, uh, syncytin, and so yeah, so it's it was uh, broken, but gained a use, a function. So yeah, gain a function, yeah, and that's the part we argue with the most about them. They they absolutely insist, like on uh, Cell Cordova released three videos with Emery Moina over the weekend, and they said. 
in a number of different places they said, and we know that uh, information can't be added, that you can only lose information. They keep stating that bl bl just bl blankly over and over again. But when you look at what information is in the genome, you know that it has to be added because we know that it changes. <laughs> right. Yeah. And I mean, if you look at any phylogeny, if, if you ex acknowledge that any two species are related, then you have to inherently uh, agree that information can change or be added. Right. At all. Yeah. If you agree that yeah, any just... two species are related. Even if we accept the arc, you know, yeah. and, and the original cat kind, and then it, it, then it changed into the tiger kind, and the tiger got stripes. Mm -hmm. Well, that's an, that's an addition of information, and right. that is by evolution. So, how can they deny that? Exactly. Yeah. Well, they they just don't. They literally just don't think about it. Like they they pay lip service in a sense because you have to remember when when creationists or when when evolution first um, was proposed, you know, by Darwin. Uh, evolution by natural selection creationists were denying that natural selection happened period right or that species changed at all and then you know by a hundred years later they're arguing okay well yeah species change but uh within limits right um and so they, they've definitely moved the goalposts but they don't really grasp what that means yeah. Uh, and that's why ideas like uh, like created heterozygosity just don't make any sense. Um, where are the other alleles in the genome? You know, how is this happening? Right. And so none of it makes any sense. They just they just have to say, well, there was a dog kind and then we got this limited diversity, uh, but it's not evolution. Well, yeah, it is. <laughs> Sorry, but it is. It kills me how bold they are when they keep saying it over and over again that, oh, we know that that genes have to be lost and the information can't be added. And they keep saying it over and over again. Right. And they don't do phylogeny. They will never attempt to make a phylogeny using the idea of just loss because it is a ridiculously non-parsimonious uh, argument. Right. Yeah. You, you can't do a phylogeny where everything is just lost. It will not work. So, um. Is the idea that these sequences are functional because they're mutational buffers a valid response? Uh, some of them probably are. I would doubt all of them are, especially things like uh, Gulo or, well, really the pseudogenes. Uh, by and large, I would say uh, probably not all mutational buffers. Uh, Gulo lost its uh, promoter region, for instance, which is why it doesn't work anymore. But uh, some of them probably are mutational buffers. I would agree with that. What's a, a mutational buffer? Uh, so oh, like oh, okay, uh, so so that we have enough of a genome that the mutations aren't going to affect that much, right? Yeah. Okay, yeah, that's what I would say for some of that, but not all of it. Yeah, sure. Let me see. I'm trying to link some videos here. We got nerd agonies. Okay, Lincoln sells three videos that he did this weekend. Nope, that's not the okay. One. We have um, <clears throat> in the side chat. Um, the the Lou animated place uh, asked basically your thoughts on a biogenesis and how you could get life from from a you know non life system or whatever and um, he's in a uh, high school situation uh, but it's like freshman prep at some sort of freshman center so he wants to be able to give get a message convey a message to his, some of his possible yec classmates and then he kind of hints that it's it's for a girl uh a, a kind of a cute girl so i i don't know where that what that has to do with anything but what kind of overview what kind of facts or or resources would would you guys direct him to to start dealing with a biogenesis from an introductory level oh boy nick lane's book uh which one is that Oh, the vital question. The, the vital, vital question. question. Yeah, that that one. That's a little dense, but uh, any others, Jackson? It it is such a complicated subject that okay, two minutes, Jackson. is all you got. Explain a bio to us. <laughs> uh, unfortunately, I am not an, an organic chem person uh, okay. or a biochem person. Um, Nick Lane's book, The Vital Question, is like as 
far as I know, the only one I've read on that subject. So sorry. There are a lot of really good books, and I'm trying to think of one that would would be. Uh, well, well, uh, David Deemer wrote a, a book about the time his his big paper uh, came out in that um, astrobiology journal. Yeah. Um, but I let me look for the name of that book. Yeah. And you know the the thing is, God, how do you even start to explain it? When it, when I was going through James Tor's video this morning, just spotting through it. Uh, they there's this one idea that we have to go from point a which is no life and we have to somehow draw this line straight to having a functioning cell right mm -hmm. and, and 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 that is so far from what happened you know if you yeah. draw another line from the first functioning cell to the eukaryote and you mm -hmm. say oh we have to you know add all these organelles and all that stuff and and that is so far from what actually happened uh, yeah as what far we had, as oh sorry I was just going to say what we have is this great, I, I call it a gigantic earth sized puddle of mud and, 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 but it's very, very complicated mud. And we don't know what all the components of that were. We don't even know exactly what the components of the atmosphere were. Right. I mean, not, mm -hmm. you know, there's still some controversy over that. Sure. Yeah. But what we did have is every uh, chemistry was ha happening every which way that it could. It wasn't following lines from uh, from rocks to nuclear, you know, to nu uh, nucleic acids. It wasn't going from rocks to proteins. It was going from rocks to very, very complicated molecules, and lots of them, and lots of diversity. And from that, the lines became drawn by some sort of statistical uh, likelihood, right? Mm -hmm. Even if it was just a half of one percent. Uh, it, it it still grew in likelihood until we ended up with life. So l life was a, like this extremely uh, energetic thing going in all different ways at once in the beginning and eventually settled down, I think, to, yeah, the, bi as, to the biology we have today. As near as I understand it, a lot of the hypotheses for how life originated tend to revolve around um, hydrothermal vents, which... Um, which spewed primarily alkaline um, chemicals and alkaline water. So you have this, you have a uh, carbon dioxide, which was dissolving in the ocean at a, at a greater capacity than it is today because there was a higher amount or higher quantity of carbon dioxide in the atmosphere, you know, nearly the, around the time that it seems life appeared. And so it's dissolving in an, in a primarily acidic ocean, right? And you're getting so you're getting carbon, and it's in H two O. So you have C H and O, all of which are, you know, major um, atoms involved in in all living organisms. And you have these hydrothermal vents, which are giving off um, like O H, and you are basically uh, having these. Um, these these uh, chemical or these atoms are all sort of mixing these molecules and they their reactions together is being catalyzed sort of on the on various rocks like grygite which have like iron sulfides uh which is also probably why we use iron iron sulfur clusters in in some of our enzymes there's probably a reason for that which goes all the way back to the origin of life yep um and so via these these minerals which are catalyzing these these processes you're getting increasingly complex atoms some of which are capable of of very primitive forms of metabolism and in fact some metabolic processes are very similar to what occurs at modern uh hydrothermal vent regions again probably not a not a wonder as to why and these are getting you know progressively more complex as as they are um changing conformation inter in interacting with other molecules creating progressively more complex molecules until you get something like what we would consider a quote living organism and as speed said this is occurring in all sorts of directions at once uh, part of the reason we really don't see this occurring today is we have buffers uh, various chemical buffers in a lot of our systems and we have uh you know bacteria viruses basically if any organic molecules at all come into the system they're going to be utilized by something be it eaten 
yeah, they get eaten pretty much immediately. So. <laughs> Want to get that, Scott? <laughs> no, it's spam. Okay. So. Anyway, anyway, uh, either your dogs or your phone. Of course, I do the phone all it's the time. Either my dogs or my phone. That's about. My sister will That's about. And, and then, um, uh, Bruce Damer and uh, and and Dahmer will tell you that, uh, or or no, Deemer, right? Deem, yeah. David Deemer, uh, also partnered with Bruce D Damer. Damer, right? Dahmer. Those two will also tell you about the uh, the uh, the hot pools of water, you know, around volcanoes, the hot spots on the earth. And, and they have a whole different idea about the origin of life. And I'm thinking that the two are definitely both valid theories. That oh yeah. Have, yeah. That, it, yeah. that how these chemicals were created was across the entire earth and in just millions of different kinds of environments. And then the only problem I see with abiogenesis that, uh, that is that I can see as a worry is concentration. Mm -hmm. Then I, but then I, I look somewhere as to how many billions of tons of organic material are delivered by just meteors during the heavy bombardment. Mm -hmm. And I, I don't know if it's billions of tons, but it was definitely in the millions of tons. So I mean, it was just right. there's a whole bunch there. But then we have concentration problems, and I think concentration problems is probably the only problem that I see left in my mind for abiogenesis is concentrating these chemicals more in one spot mm -hmm. to some degree. And what do you think of that? Yeah, I think you're, you're probably right. That, and that seems to be one of the major like creationist uh, arguments too, is really just the, the concentration problem at this point. Yeah. Cause I, cause like once you get metabolism going, which you get geo there are geochemical processes that sort of mimic um or maybe it's the biological processes mimicking the, the geochemical processes but um you know once you sort of get things sort of going then it's it's relatively easy to kind of evolve the system but yeah you're right i think it's getting to that yeah. point now, there's another kind of chemistry that i that i dipped mm -hmm. into some 30 years ago and that was inorganic chemistry of minerals and when you look when you look at minerals, uh, you, you know, you normally think, oh, it's just calcium sulfate or you know something like that, real simple. Mm -hmm. But it's not. There are these incredible structures that form in inorganic compounds. These uh, these uh, chelates, I think they call them, and uh, crystal structures, and these these structures that form with water, so that these so that you have these uh, catalytic centers in geology right. itself right right then that's that was what i was uh mentioning with the the iron sulfur clusters yeah 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 and they're just it, it they be they're just incredibly complex and beautiful to look at they're mm -hmm. uh they're amazing i've got i've got a book on the shelf somewhere Which, from a long so time ago. needless to say none of what we've said means you came from a rock <laughs> right yeah 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 i've never been to a rock um I'd like to go if, if uh, you know, if it were safer. Ha, 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 ha. I'm just, you know. I know. That was stupid. But, you know, it's really <laughs> true. I would like to go to Iraq if it were safer. But you're right. That was stupid of me to say. I apologize <laughs> to the world. Oh, no. I feel that I'm being canceled. Oh, God, no. Yeah. yeah. Did you just make a joke about Iraq? Iraq? That was Scott. I was, like, I was saying. I threw, that. I threw Scott out of the room. I just, oh my gosh! You kicked him. Yeah, I, I can't. Uh, I can't answer that. I've been canceled. Because uh, <laughs> you know, in case anyone is 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 blissfully ignorant, Kent Hovind loves to say, "You believe you came from a rock." If you yep. accept evolution is true, but uh, no, no one believes that. So yeah. Yeah. anyway, yep. Uh, hey, Jack. Hello, it's Andrew. Hi, Do you Andrew. remember me? Probably yes. not. Don't I, know who I, you are. I uh, yes, I, we we interacted um a little while back, I believe. I think it was like APS Junior's channel, right? Uh, I th I think so. That sounds right. Okay. You, yeah, you, yeah, your I, name reminds me of of a guy I used to be aware of, uh, and I thought it was him for a moment. Oh, oh, uh, sorry. You guys remember? Uh, Oh, God, that's probably a bad idea to say it. But uh, Ronnie, Rational Empiricism. 
Oh, who the hell? Okay, refresh. He was a he was a creationist. He ran in the same circle uh, circles as like G Man and the other older uh, creationists who used to be on YouTube all the time. Right. I don't even know if he still does YouTube anymore, honestly. Uh, But anyway, that's what your your name reminded me of. Yeah, you got a bad name there, Andrew. Oh no! (laughs) I'm so sorry. Oh no! Yeah. I'm Sounds like you've been canceled too, Andrew. I don't know if G-Man does. Does he do YouTube anymore? Now that I think about it, I haven't heard anything. Yeah, he does. Him. Un- unfortunately, I, th- I think a video popped out here about a week ago where he was doing really? something. Yeah. I, no one has like said anything about him as far as I've seen in a while. Maybe it was a video about G-Man. I, I don't know. Maybe it wasn't G-Man. I don't know. That's funny. Uh, I, I I'm not sure when I may or may not be leaving. So, well, ja- Jackson mentioned something on baromenology, so I was hoping I oh, could ask yes. a quick question. Yeah. Okay, okay, let me preface that. Those three things that uh, basically uh, Emery Moyna and Sal Cordova, their big thing, is, uh, Emery Moyna's big thing is baromeno- baromenology. So anyway, you right. want to check some of the shit he's coming up with, but go ahead. Yeah, um, so, so I've heard this claim by... Uh, I, I think SFT and uh, uh, George Bond, who I believe are not big fans of yours, Jackson. Um, I've heard of Bond. Night. I've never interacted with him. Uh, he's a mess. Yeah. <laughs> well, a- a- anyways, um, so, so they've made the claim that the rapid speciation events that we've observed today, such as the, the ones with fruit flies or the ones with uh, Darwin's finches in the Galapagos, um, according to them, that, uh, proves or supports uh, hyper speciation post flood. Right. Well, yeah. okay, so the the <laughs> the rapid in terms of the finches is the past five million years. Yeah. So I, I mean, look, if they're old Earth creationists now, I at least respect their position a little bit more. But um, uh, and as for fruit flies, I'm afraid I'm not super familiar with the uh, phylogenetics of Drosophila. Um, so you have to forgive me on that one, but yeah, with, with the finches, they're different genera, uh, like uh, GSB which is kind of the, the main one that's been studied by like the grants over the years, um, and Sarthidia and Platyspiza and all those guys. But, but it, yeah, that's over 5 million years. Yeah. Well, so, didn't so- they come up with some recent research on, uh, something that happened over the last 30 years to their beaks? You right. can, yeah. So you can get like, yeah, like millimeter scale um, uh, uh, changes in in the beak, like width and and uh, height and all that sort of stuff, um, because uh, you have the dry season, and so these guys are are um, uh, iteroparous, and so they're you know giving birth multiple times, I guess a year, and and uh, as a result, those who need to subsist on less food. Right, are having like smaller beak sizes, um, and so that's great. You know, that's that is it is really interesting work. Uh, Jonathan Weiner's book, The Beak of the Finch, goes into all that sort of stuff. Yeah. Um, but again, I mean, that's natural selection operating on on its its beak size. They're not they haven't they're not changing species per se, because from the models of, of speciation that I've seen, it seems to take. Somewhere between about five hundred thousand and a million years, typically, for like species to develop. Right, because what you want to call a species. Right. Yeah. You, right. Typically for yeah. for macroscopic organisms, but yeah. So. Because I mean, if, if hyper evolution was a thing, which it's not, because like you say, the the rates we observe today aren't near uh, high enough to to make that possible, but like. Mm-hmm. Um. Uh. Ah. Uh, darn it! I forgot what I was gonna say. Um. Well, like, because the thing or, is that someone say something, and I'm gonna try and remember. Well, I, it's. I, I would still say that it, it's nonsense for them to try to push a, a series of speciation speciation events that have been occurring over five million years as evidence that in the past four thousand years hundreds of genera 
Right. Know, oh, no, okay. Now I remember. Yeah, like, I, I was gonna say that. Like, how, if if that was correct, wouldn't we be observing like dozens more speciation events going on today? Like, yes. like you said, the the rate is over thousands, millions of years. So, right. Um, RJ and I point because we did a whole chapter on baromenology in the Rocks Are There Volume One. It's it's a chapter five, and one of the things we talk about is if you're going to say that the um, the family level, which is just an arbitrary taxonomic construct is the kind, is, is the bearman, then if you look at like the Staphylinid beetles, for instance, of which there are over like a hundred thousand, that's, that's, we're talking about species per year, right? Right. Yeah. So no, <laughs> that's definitely not happening. And of course they deny that it, it would be evolution in the first place. Which... Right. And again, you know, challenge them to come up with a, phylogeny um come up with tell them to come up with a phylogeny based on genetics right um you know jacks i'm curious considering your knowledge of phylogeny what's the basic idea that the phylogeny challenge is supposed to convey Ooh, good question oh um so the phylogeny challenge uh in essence is is um what was put forth originally by arn raw well it was formulated by arn raw though you can sort of find other people referencing like versions of it um it's basically where do you draw the line in terms of relatedness and creationists have arbitrarily hitched their horse to the it's the family which again doesn't mean anything family a family in taxonomy can mean anything from one member it could be a monotypic family like a, the phylum placozoa for instance contains a single species oh, yeah. well quote quote contains a single species it probably has multiple species in it but um contains just one whereas you know as i said with the staphylinid beetles you have like a hundred thousand at least species within this family and so it doesn't mean anything it doesn't convey anything about the ecology about the degree of, of genetic relatedness about the degree of morphological relatedness between a set it literally just means these guys are more closely related to each other than to another group right so yeah, that's and, a good point and so the phylogeny challenge is pick a a uniform genetic or morphological or ecological marker by which you can delineate one kind from another and they can't and the, the creationists can't yeah. they are just flatly unable to so my, my an another way of putting it might be like uh taking the the supposed methods of baromenology and putting them to the same rigorous standards as typical phylogenetics and seeing uh, if, if they can come up with separate kinds, right? Right. And the, the funny thing about it is when they do this and when they include large data sets, they get overlap between the data right. sets. Because the whole point is we're figuring out who's not related. And so uh, uh, Todd Wood, David Cavanaugh, and Kurt Wise did an analysis on on the horse monobaramon on Equidae. And so what they found was everything from, from Hyracotherium which isn't even an equidae, it's in Paleotheridae, which is the sister family to equids. Um, Hyracotherium on up to the modern equus all constitute one baromen. Hmm. That entire, you know, change from like a dog-sized, five-toed uh, little mammal with, you know, a particular dentition all the way up to your modern horse with one toe and a totally different set of, of dentition. Well, what what didn't you know, Jackson? Horse evolution has been disproven fifty years ago. Well, the funny thing is, these these are creationists. You know, Todd Wood's a creationist. He's not a right. Boy, not that it, Emery Moyna, Emery Moyna, and Cell really don't like Todd Wood. I don't think. I, personally, I love Todd Wood. I think he's great. Yeah. He also did. You guys see the analysis he did? Where and actually, interestingly, I met someone else, um, and I hope Erica talks to him soon. Um, who works with Todd Wood, and they found that Australopithecus sediba is in the human baromen. Hmm. Did you guys hear about that? No. no. It's Isn't that beautiful, though? Yeah. An Australopithecine yeah. nests with the humans. Just yeah. Chef's kiss. That's why they don't like Todd Wood. <laughs> Great I mean, you know, like, the, the, those data sets are based on, well, mostly morphologic data am i correct right yeah exactly it's all it's all fossil. it's not even considering genetic 
exactly. Yeah, it's it's all fossil data um, because, well, we do have, you know, the genetic data for Neanderthals and they're like, oh, Neanderthals are just right. weird humans, which no, they're not. We, right. we know they're not. <laughs> yeah. So this Henry Moynai has a recent video of nine hours ago, genetic equivalence and bar baraminology. Oh, dear. So he's done a few of them. Yeah. Braminology according to IGH. I'm not sure what IGH is. And is that he's, an is immunoglobulin? He, I don't know. It, the, this is one of his things that he goes on. He doesn't really say a lot. He promises to say a lot, but then he mostly just complains about other braminologists. <laughs> mostly. I, I don't know. I've been trying to figure it out. I bought Todd Wood's book. Uh, he's got this like lengthy book where he goes through a whole bunch of baramins. And, you know, with a bunch of data, and I, I don't know what the hell to make of it. But he, oddly enough, he didn't include uh, uh, canines, I don't think. And felids weren't mm -hmm. in there either. Wood is a very curious uh, creationist. He's one of yeah. the, like, yeah, evolution's true, but I'm a Christian, so too bad. Yeah. Um, which, I'm at least he's honest, I guess, you know. <laughs> you got to give him that. But um, um, uh, who used Todd's wood? Oh, that was uh, Phil Center, who is a paleontologist. Yeah, so Phil Center um, it, uh, is a paleontologist, and and he took the uh, one of the I think it was like ANOPA, one of the baromenological programs that Todd Wood uses, and the other baromenologists, and he showed that Archaeopteryx, yeah, the birds nest among the the Coelurosaurian dinosaurs, which yes, you know they do so. Um, it's kind of amazing. Uh, RJ and I also discussed that. Um, it's, it's very funny watching, like watching them try to honestly do baromenology is kind of funny because when, when they get the, when they use a very small character set and they get these, these, uh, groups, which, you know, are, un which they say are unrelated, then it's kind of easy to see through their method. But I mean, in fairness, right. you're going to get character or you're going to get groups which um you're going to get groups which are separate from each other right i mean that's just how that's just how evolution works you're going to get these. this is how nested hierarchy works right exactly so you are going to get these differences but that doesn't mean they're unrelated to each other right. well well the, just... the, the the only uh uh objection to this or the one that i've seen the most is again from sft like in, in response to these statistical methods or well i i don't see him address them that much but like especially when talking about universal common ancestry he typically uh mentions the uh barcoding analyses and how they supposedly show that uh humans are are separate from other animals and therefore universal common ancestry is is destroyed quote unquote so there's a vi I don't know if, if you've seen it or, or if anybody here has seen it, but there's a, a video on my channel that actually Evograd did where he oh, picked yeah, apart yeah. that that barcoding argument um, because they, they use some very weird data. It, it, uh, it's pretty much the same as the, the baromenology uh, complications, right? Right. Yeah. If, if you if you say, for instance, um, OK, so this we have a certain set of of nucleotide differences that differentiate us from chimpanzees. Okay. Yes, we do. Um, and they say, all right, that's the kind. Okay. Well apply that same standard to chimps and gorillas. Then they're also separate kinds and do it to gorillas right. and chimps and orangutans. And, and they're all separate. It's like, yeah, if you do that to anything, you're going to get different kinds for like most species. And then they don't want that. So they sort of chuck it out the window for everything else. So. I mean the, the 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 consistent way of doing it, and of course they don't have to be consistent in their worldview. But like the consistent way of doing it is either special creation of individual species, which of course we know is wrong, yeah, or just evolution over uh, millions of years. You can't get hyper evolution of separate kinds over several thousand years. It's just not physically possible. Right. Yeah. It yeah, the, there's there's no consistency. There's no logic to any of it. It's just th throw every method at the wall, hope it sticks, and if it doesn't, right. oh well. 
By the way, Speed, if I'm nerding too much about phylogenetics, please stop me. Oh, no, no. Uh, I took the wings off of a stink bug, and that's what's on my screen right there. Oh, very interesting. Um, are stink bugs hemiptera or homoptera? Oh, uh, boy, you ask hard questions there, Jackson. I don't know. <laughs> I can't. Okay, I thought they were coleoptera. Or uh, where, uh, wait. Are they? Oh, well, let's find out. Stink let's just go find bug. out, man. Wikipedia. Brown. That's a brown marmorated stink bug. That's the invasive species. They are hemiptera. Is this one, is this uh, one of your stink bugs, Speed? Yeah, yeah, it is. And I, okay. I've got, I ripped the wings off him and I glued him. And then I started carving him up. So I don't know if you can see this or not, but uh, let's see if I can find the right instrument. But I started trying to look at his insides, and and uh, so I'm kind of breaking the cover off and looking at the insides. But they're pretty well emaciated right now, so my stink bug is not healthy. <laughs> anyway, yeah, you, probably need to set up stink, <laughs> you need to set up your stink bugs with a uh, IV. I know, I know, I know. It, it. It's speed. There's his eyes. What? Wow. Can I respond yeah. to something Otangelo said real quick? Otangelo is telling us we're going to go to hell if we keep timing them out. Okay. <laughs> the, this one right here? Yeah. Um, so, Otangelo, can you tell me the difference between 80% of the proteins being different, but like a single amino acid and the proteins being different altogether? Right. Yeah. Please write that out, Otangelo. That, that needs to be clarified. Yeah. Yeah. And I, I, I can't let Otangelo in my rooms anymore until he apologizes. By how the, much are these 80% of human proteins different? That's also a very good question, Nestle. Right. Yeah, uh, between me and you, we have a lot of proteins that are different. Like, Sure. I mean, thousands of them, yeah. That's, you know, that's what alleles are. You know? Right, right, exactly. Yeah. Nestle has a question he wants answered, but I'm not sure which question it is. And are, think, when you're saying tell him, do you mean Jackson, Nestling? I think you meant Otangelo. There was the question about by how much are the 80% of proteins different. Yeah, I think oh, he's okay. asking Otangelo. Gotcha. I, would, That's taken care of. I would bet, like, on average, you know, like 99% similar. So, at least. Or, so, so, Jackson, do you see those two red spots? Yes. Yep, those are some sort of photoreceptors on top of this bug's head. And the eyes are to the left and right. Mm-hmm. And I, I uh, what was the other species that had that that uh, brain bug told us about? Was it a? Oh, I can't remember. Wait, praying mantis or something? Some other species has these little, but those are very different kinds of eyes or different kinds of photoreceptors. I think on these stink bugs, these mar marmorated, uh, brown marmorated stink bug. It is a ha ha heliomorpha helis. Is what it is, and I got them all. for some reason this year. I picked about 40 of these things off my ceiling, and I'd never seen them before. So it's something new that moved into Minnesota this year. Not good, and they like so are those little in. black, black bead looking things or in, in indentions or those stink modules or something. I can't tell if they're indentions or if, if they're uh, if they're actually Oops. little round spheres. Uh, I'm pretty sure, Ooh. yeah, they they are indentions. You you can kind of see. What if they it. were they ticks or stereo. mites? Ooh. I got in stereo. No, they have them all over the place, and I I don't no. know if that's where. What was that chemical I said they come out of? Uh, hand oh, a second. You told us, but I can't remember. Yeah, and it, it it's related to uh, cell membranes. Actually, it's a it, I, I think it's a phospho. It's a lipid. I thought no, it was a it was it a terpene. It was a terpene. So it's related to pine trees, the thing that makes stink bugs stink. I forget what it was exactly. Well, let me see if I can find it here. Okay, the red integument between the sclerites. Okay, nymph stages with a red in. I don't know what the no, I don't know what that is. Okay, no, that's something else. I thought they were going to talk about its eyes, but I'm trying to find out what makes them. Oh, here we go. Okay, it's trans two decanel. So it it's uh oh, what is that? That's a uh, that's an alkene. I mean, it's a real simple thing. It's almost like a gasoline. 
trans 2 oct to octanol and trans 2 decanal. So that means it has 10 and 8 carbons in it, and it has a couple of a one double bond, a trans double bond, and that makes it stink. But I, I lost my sense of smell four years ago, so I don't know if they stink or not. My son said they don't. So he was he was arguing with me. They they ain't stink bugs because they don't stink. Well, I don't know if that's the case. <laughs> There's I, something I've called never, keratitis. never stunk in my opinion. Okay. Uh, they have, okay, stink bugs' body fluids are toxic and irritating, irritating the human skin and eyes. One case of keratitis, they call it, has been reported in Taiwan. Apparently, they're not very toxic because we don't have a lot of it. But mm. anyway, and then over here, I got another one glued down, which I'm ready to dissect. Which is, let me see here, go up. That's his bottom, and they're pretty desiccated. I've had them laying out here for a few days, so. And you can see it's proboscis folded along the bottom. Uh, oh, oh my God. I, I have too much light. I'm sorry. That little groove that runs from his head down, that's where his long proboscis is. And it's almost as long. It's about one third as long as his body. And mm -hmm. they drill into fruits. And if you get an apple with a brown spot on it, the chances are that it's one of these suckers drilled that proboscis into the apple and sucked the juices out of it. So they've and got they a retractable nose? Uh, kind of. Well, mouth part. And okay. they so they, they suck the juice out of fruits, and, and they're causing $80 million worth of damage a year in the U.S. right now mm -hmm. from uh, because the fruit will get rotten after they puncture it. So, mm -hmm. But he's too dry for me to pull that proboscis out, but it's – I don't know. Can you, yeah, you, uh, can you see my, my yeah, mouth? Yeah, I can see it. Mm -hmm. Okay, right there is where the proboscis is, and it goes all the way down, and then it folds up. That's where he keeps it folded up. Here's his antennae, and anyway, enough stink. You guys have heard about the, the soapberry bugs, right? And I think it was Florida? No. Um, so these bugs, they, they have you know, these long proboscis, and they use it to dr basically drill into, uh, it was a type of fruit. I don't remember what the type of fruit was was have these long proboscis to drill into these these fruits. And then a, uh, a non-native plant was introduced to their region. And they, in, in just a few decades, they basically evolved their proboscis to be a lot shorter so they could eat the much smaller fruits, which grew on this, this other tree. That was just in a few decades. Oh, I, I feel like I've heard that, yeah. Kind of neat. Uh, let's see here. Quick time watch cam full. I'm trying to figure out what I'm doing. Kind of off topic, but Jackson, have you by any chance seen the uh, raw mat video? I, I think we went over on this channel, but the one on human evolution. I've I've never watched uh, standings videos, raw mats videos, Emery, Sal. I I don't have really the desire or <laughs> the time in a lot of cases to. Yeah, yeah. Brace, brace Jackson's co-writing a book. You're co-authoring a book. You're going to school, and you're doing stuff on your own channel. So that's a that's a heavy load. I I, wait, I mean, wait. go ahead. Or or just would you like me to give you the the gist of their argument? Sure, go ahead. Oh, all right. yeah, the what, soapberry speak. bugs. There it is. Yeah. Oh, that's soapberry bug. Yeah. All right, go ahead. Yeah. So uh, basically, what he did was he he didn't say that it was from 1965 but he took the famous march of progress image and sort of pretended that that's what we think now and used the in between the lines arguments that uh they're not directly related to us because they're not our direct ancestors or they're not part of the human lineage because they say they might be side branches and that's kind of the whole argument in that that short little video. And I was kind of appalled because, I mean, we've known for a while now that evolution is not linear. So to take this popular science image and pretend that it's the actual science uh, strikes me as a bit dishonest, to put it well, lightly. Well, I mean, it's raw, Matt. This is the guy who 
says you can live on breathing alone. You know, you don't sure, have to eat yeah. food. Uh, <laughs> so I, <laughs> you know, his um, raw Matt's opinion on a lot of things is um, not exactly valued uh, by me, but, but um, I actually, uh, well, yeah, I'm, I'm not surprised. He probably really does think that, yeah, there it is. Yeah, the, the soapberry bug found in Florida for it's known for its rapid evolution. Um, he probably really does think that that's like all we have in terms of human evolution. Um, he probably doesn't even know the names of like all the the species which are shown in that <laughs> in that picture. Um, but yeah, it's it's raw, Matt. You know what do you expect? This guy, yeah, uh, thought that. Um, was it the isopod, the serolid isopods, or actual trilobites? Um, or that? Wait, wait. He said, he said what now? He thought that that like serolid isopods, which look kind of like sort of like trilobites. He thought they were actual trilobites. He oh, thought that, that a parrot. Priceless. He thought Cetacosaurus was a parrot. And I did a video where I made fun of him for that. Um, the video is uh, the Harun Yaya method. Ah, uh, yeah, Yaya if it looks similar, it is. Yeah, I've seen yeah. that one. And so, um, uh, actually, got in, in touch with Exabyte Spider for that. <laughs> interestingly, um, and so, yeah, it, it's it's just it's such a bad argument, and it requires no knowledge of of you know functional morphology or genetics or phylogeny to to make this argument. So, of course, he would be the one to make it. Right. Whatever. <laughs> whatever. So this, I, whatever. Isopoda? Is that the one that he yeah. thought was? Okay. Uh, here, let me see if I can spell it in the side chat here. Cerulean Isopod. And so, it, you know, some of them do look kind of like trilobites, but that's the thing. They look kind of like trilobites. Kind Cerulean of. Isopod. Um, they don't have the mouth parts that trilobites have uh, because trilobites, uh, depending on your phylogeny, but they typically fall uh, close to the chilocerus. <laughs> they have some similarities in their mouth parts, for instance, which uh, crustaceans don't have because crustaceans so have mandibles. Yeah, yes, like that to... guy. Yeah, okay. Here we got it. He's trying to argue that, you know, trilobites are still around because oh yeah and so living fossil is what he was trying to trying to right put up. and they're nowhere near related to trilobites they're independently hey. sort of trilobite-esque hey jackson um you sound like you're having a wonderful time um have you have you looked at the clock lately yeah i do i oh, do need yeah. to, to jump, you gotta go so, uh i appreciate <laughs> okay, you I'll having me on and, and I, I hope to be on again in the future so. Well, see, I thought about just not saying anything and just <laughs> oh, you know, yeah. go, 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 but then again, it was going to be within the next like five minutes. But yeah, you're right. So uh, okay, I, did, I, right. Did, I didn't realize that just inviting you was was enough to get you on. So I'm really shocked. Oh, you mean if you invite somebody, they they'll come on? Well, I, I, I mean, didn't I would, know that. Okay. I'm not normally I'm not normally free at this time, um, or at least I wasn't last semester. But I am typically free at you know for like an hour. Uh, so. Yeah, yeah. I think last year I invited you like a hundred times, and you came on once, so I got kind of sad. I only saw like like <laughs> two or three emails from you, in all honesty. Okay, uh, I'll do it more often. Um, I mean, yeah, you know, just uh, doesn't know the answer, which means he didn't read the paper. Yeah, that's right. Okay, okay so just, anyway, all right, just well, before you go, just before you go, uh -huh. uh, Nestle wants to say. Please let Jackson know that Otangelo doesn't know yeah, the answer. He, he saw it, Scott. Yeah, oh, he it. did? He got it. He got it. I'm yeah. sorry. Oh, I'm canceling fine. myself again. Cancel. <laughs> All right. Well, you guys have a wonderful day. See you, Jackson. Bye. Yeah, unfortunately, I have to take off as well, too. I got to go pick something up from store. Yeah, unfortunately, I have to take, out, take off as well. I, I, I lost interest. No, <laughs> you guys I'm really sorry. <laughs> Andrew, it was great having you on. It's, you're all, of course, yeah. it's always great having you on. Oh, thank you. Yeah, I'm, I'm, I'm glad I could talk to Jackson for at least a little bit. So thanks for letting me join. What are you getting at the store? Uh, textbooks. Oh, Ooh. where? 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 Uh, for, for school. Oh, at the bookstore. He's going to the school bookstore. Where, okay, it's 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 like uh, the school ripoff store. Okay, can you can you like give me a virtual tour of your school bookstore? That'd be cool. 
Uh, I don't know. No, you better not because no, I can't spend the money. Yeah, no. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. They banned me at the University of Minnesota <laughs> from their bookstore there because I was spending too much money there. So they threw me out. Yeah. Okay. All right. Well, I'll catch you guys later. Have a good day. Bye. You too, man. Yeah. You wanna, you wanna open it up? Do you want to open it up, Speed? Oh, sure. Yeah, we can open it up. We got nothing. I will else. throw out a link. I would definitely like to see some of these folks come in and chat with us. Wait a minute. Okay. Be careful you don't hit anybody when you throw it out there in chat. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. Don't if I apologize if I hit you with a, a flying link. Okay. Be careful. Got to dodge them. Anyway, let's see what else. So we covered tour. We covered uh, the three things that Sal Cordova did. There's a whole lot. He, he goes over some papers, and, of course, he gets it all wrong. <laughs> Along with everything. It's midnight. Oh, my goodness. Yeah, it's midnight. How are you doing? Proving that we will let anybody in here. Oh, wow. <laughs> Fuck off. <laughs> <laughs> Yep, it's an open room. Hey, how are you so, doing? Oh well, you know, pretty well. Uh, I've just I've just been working on Kane Academy. Uh, you know, doing interesting things, free, you know, pre algebra, computer programming. What is know, it? Oh, Khan Academy. Khan oh. Academy. I don't know. I probably oh. pronounced it weird. Khan! Yeah, they yeah, they have uh, Scott. They have some pretty fast things. You know what's really good for math? Purple math. Have you ever seen that? Site? Uh, yes, I have. I've used it before. It's really good. Yeah, the really yeah, good. Rub, I, I used to rub rub it all over me before a math test, and I, I usually did good. Oh, yeah, purple math. It smells good too. Scott, what is wrong with you? Yep. I don't know. I'm just saying stupid stuff today. It's just my day for it. It's all kinds. Yeah, I took, you know, I've been taking pre-algebra. You know, I've also, I've also, I've also, I've also, I've also. Uh, uh, you know, I've also dabbled, you know, dabbled into, you know, in in some multivariable calculus. That's that's fascinating. Oh, that's fun. Yes. Yes, multivariable calculus using vectors and matrices and you know all that good stuff. On Khan Academy. Yes. Oh. They have that too. They have they have literally everything. But they have they have they have organic chemistry. They have regular chemistry. They have speed chemistry. I don't know. They 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 have a lot. Yep. Oh. Who the hell needs to go to college anymore? Just use Kane Academy. I know. Yeah, but you got to have discipline, and I find that the structure of signing up for a course gives you some discipline. So I kind of want to do more of that. That's what I should really be doing instead of these goddamn weather reports. Well, I mean, I mean, I mean, speed. You, 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 you can develop discipline, like you know, in anything. You know, if you if you want to, like, yeah, yeah, sure, yeah, sure. You could say that the, uh, you know, like you know, like you're paying for a course. Uh, it's supposed to develop discipline because you paid money for it. But let's be honest here. How many people? How many people? How many people pay for something? You know what I mean, but you know, but don't do it, or you know, just, yeah. just you know, just yeah, uh, like my, my gym members membership. Yeah, so you know, so so the whole money thing, like, like the whole money thing, is you know, you know, determines, you know, develops uh, discipline is dumb or you know wrong. Okay, what color is the cat named Midnight? I'm pretty sure it was white, right? <laughs> I mean, I'm it? purple. What the hell are you talking about? Okay. Okay. Anyway, he has a cat named Midnight. Uh, yeah, I don't know. Develop discipline. What a concept. Signing yes. up for a gym, gym membership over and over again during the pandemic hasn't worked out for me. Because <laughs> I'd gone to extreme lockdown again. I mean, why don't you... Why don't you... Why don't you... Why don't you have your sons put a leash on you and walk you? Uh, well, he will in the summer... It's zero degrees out there right now, Fahrenheit. So, no walking today. Not happening. So, I mean, what you kind of uh, do, you could always do you you could always do some shadow boxing. Uh, so, what who? would you do at a gym, anyways? Oh, I have these wonderful. I have this gym that has the most wonderful leg exercise machines, and I love them. Except. 
there are other people in there. None of them have masks and are all breathing really hard. So I ran away. <laughs> I mean, so. speed, speed. Shadow boxing is literally punching your shadow. Okay, but but who do you who who do you box? Your your shadow. You just you just you just you know you you, you just stand there and throw punches at your shadow. I I I don't see the point. <laughs> okay, well, whatever. Like I, you know, I've been doing, uh, I've been doing well, it for over four months. And okay, look at me. That. I'm as confident there, as I'm as confident as a bird. There was that time I that have, I, oh, there was that time that I did some mushrooms and I did. My shadow was trying to kill me, so that's literally that. okay. Whatever. Uh, okay. So I have weighted clothes, uh, clothing for that. For, okay, uh, go cool. cool. If I wanted to. Okay, Waited? Goku. <laughs> just don't use too say, hard, are you? Oh, weighted clothes? You mean you put? Oh, yeah. I mean just like wrist, wrist and ankle and weights, stuff. and then the vest. Yeah. yeah, you gotta be careful with those. You can throw your knee out. But I used to do techno dancing. I used to do techno dancing with thirty pound weights in my hands when I was in my forties, and that was actually Why? really a good workout. Techno dancing with weights? Oh man, it's wonderful. Except you can really fuck yourself up if you start with. Um, you got to start out small. You don't want to start out. I want to try. I want to try psychedelics. Uh, this this show does not condone psychedelics or midnight. But. <laughs> okay, so then why did you let me on, asshole? If you don't <laughs> condone me. <laughs> Well, I mean, I do we need to do? Do we need to do a disclaimer that says just because we let you on the show doesn't mean we necessarily endorse you or yes, the, you the participants' views are not necessarily the views of Answers in Atheism or ninety four point three percent of the rest of the human population. Yes. Right. Okay. Oh, we'll our, another, I'll have our lawyers get on that. There was another thing I wanted to talk about, and that was Richard Sternberger. He is, he claims to be a intellectually satisfied atheist when he was younger. And now he what works the, for, he, he, he works for ICR. He went to work for the Smithsonian and he got thrown out because he published a paper by Meyer on intelligent design. And then he went through a whole bunch of uh, like legal battles and all kinds of Intellectually bullshit. satisfied atheist. I'm still, I'm still trying to process that. But anyway, I read his article. Okay, there's a bio that they talk about, and I can uh, try to get a link to it. Let me see if I can find a link to it. But uh, he is a very fascinating character. When you listen to him, he sounds brilliant. And he's got this idea about uh, something about a uh, logically, uh, how the hell does he put it, Like a, almost like a mathematical universe that he's thinking about. But he works for the ICR because they promised to let him do the research that he wanted to do. He doesn't necessarily ever claim to be a theist or whatever, but anyway, Sel and Emery Moyna were going on about him and they love him. And I kind of like the guy too, except when I read his articles in, in, in uh, ICR, he presents a whole bunch of really badly reasoned stuff. But then if you read his papers, on uh, I think he studies crabs and fish and stuff like that. The man is brilliant, and I thought it was so. So I, so I'm reading this guy, and I'm trying to trying to make a decision about him, and I think I'm beginning to like him. But yet he does these crap. He did this crappy article for ICR about signs and lines, right? And it was just very poorly reasoned, and so I don't know. So I'm like of two. I'm of two opinions about this man, and I can't quite figure out how to how to feel about him. So anyway, but I'll see maybe, if I can give you some links. Maybe it's accurate to say the man is inconsistent. Well, I guess if you work for ICR, I think every now and then you have to put out a stupid article that makes evolution look false. Otherwise, they, they won't pay you anymore. Is that fair? I, mean, I call bullshit on that. I want proof. I uh, I don't know. Okay. I really don't care. I'm just saying. Okay, so the uh, Sternberg review controversy. Let me see if I got it here. Where the hell is it? Oh, start cam. Whoops. I started cam twice. Okay. 
There's a Wikipedia article about it now, and I think this may have been covered in Expelled, but I'm not entirely sure. But uh, this is, he published, okay, he was a peer reviewer or he was an editor in charge of articles for the Smithsonian, and he published this article by uh, Stephen Meyer. And he got so much pushback on it that eventually he lost his job. But I think it's a little more Gee, complicated. I wonder than why. That. Well, I think he may have lost his job for other reasons because he said himself that he's very unfocused in his research and stuff. Uh, dumb, look at look at the oh, okay. I will look at that stupid New Year's whore energy now. <laughs> stupid whore energy. I love her. Yeah. So stupid energy. We could just call her stupid XX energy because she keeps changing it. Okay, so I'm going to take a look at that. But no, he's not that dumb, you know, and that's what kills me is he does all these dumb things occasionally when he's when he's in one venue and when he's in another venue, he doesn't, you know, so. I mean, isn't that, isn't that, isn't that a lot of people, a lot of people, you know, in their, you know, in their, in, in, in their own field, in their own fields, they're brilliant, but, you know, but, you know, but once they go out of that field, they're just, yeah, Tell okay. Me. Here's his problem. He he may be a brilliant biologist, but he lacks knowledge of molecular biology. Because when he was talking about lines and signs, he just got a lot of stuff really wrong. It doesn't, you know, doesn't 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 uh standing for truth and you know like that side, uh, you know, like you know, like you know, always talking about how you know, they, they, you know there's this there's this great scientist who who says, Oh, you know, bio biogenesis can happen. But he's more, you know, he's more of a he's more of a physical, a physical chemist that you know, they, they're an organic chemist. I forget his name. Yeah, yeah. There's that problem. There's these silos. Like when, when people get a PhD or they start doing research, I think they end up in silos. And I don't think people that are uh, uh, what do they call us autodidacts end up in silos like that. So I don't know. Not well, sorry. not 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 like not always, but it can. But it can happen. So, what is that brain bug? What do we got here? Isn't hey. she? She's so beautiful. Look at her. So she was, a, a, a sling. That's what they call baby tarantulas when you get them as babies. When I got her, I got her right before Christmas, and she was still in her baby clothes, which is her whole body being pretty pretty much orange. And then she molted and came out yesterday. Uh, Oh. Looking all beautiful like this. Uh, you must be a proud you, mama. You, or, yeah, you I, know. I really am. You can't really. See, I, I'm. I'm a terrible camera person, but she's gorgeous. Like uh, it all looks black in this lighting, but her legs are like have a metallic blue sheen to them, and then her care her uh, cephalothorax, uh, the top of it has a, uh, a a green hue to it, and then her her abdomen, which is you can kind of see the the furry part down there is like this bright orange color really beautiful spider and we'll, oh. i'll be able to handle her and stuff too because she's uh she's pretty the, the species is pretty docile do they if they bite you what happens to you um well Hurts? it'd probably it'd probably be like getting stung by a bee for me um but i've never been bit by a tarantula so it could be uh it could be I could have a bad reaction to it. I could have to go to the hospital. <laughs> depends on the species and depends on how my body reacts. You never know. Wow. But I suppose, you know, if you've got like a if you own a, a like I owned a Saint Bernard and his teeth teeth were about four inches long, and I thought if he ever got mad at me, he he could rip my leg off. <laughs> you know, but oh yeah. But he never did. So I guess it's probably the same thing, but I don't well, know. I mean, I mean, I mean, speed. It's it's in his name, right? Saint Bernard. He's a saint. Oh, he's a saint. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. Okay, that was a stupid joke, but you get the point. <laughs> well, this yeah. one's called a green bottle blue. Uh, the species name here. That's their. Well, that's their their layman's name, anyway. <laughs> so, like, if you're you're shopping for them or whatever, then that's where you would find it at. But uh, the actual uh, uh it's a new world species so it's pretty docile uh most new world species are there's some that i wouldn't mess with i don't i don't 
recommend anybody uh, <laughs> messes with like yeah. a. I imagine if something like that bit me, uh, I'd probably get a huge whelp on my arm. Yeah. Like that. And I don't know that necessarily it would be poisonous, but uh, it would be big and ugly. That's what I imagine. So Dessel Drace is trying to line up Otangelo for a talk. Why would you do that, Dessel? Because I th- Otangelo I think still- is interesting to talk to, even though he's a... I don't know. Actually, no, he's not interested in talking to What the fuck am I talking about? That must be high. Well, I'm just thinking yeah. maybe Otangelo think, or uh, Dessel thinks that there's hope for Otangelo yet, that he will actually read the science. And, um, yeah, honey, I don't, think, I, I don't think there is any hope for Otangelo. Sorry, mm-hmm. honey, but there is no hope for you. So, Brainbug, did you catch my bit on the stink bug? Uh, the I, vi- video I did of the story of stink bug. I did not. Oh, okay. I just, I, I've got one that I glued to my clay and I'm starting to tear them apart, but they're kind of desiccated. They're, they're, uh, they, they, they've been under the microscope for a week, so they're drying out, but I've been, I tore his wings off and, uh, I don't know. Kind of interesting. Day, what day did you do that? I know we had talked about getting together on Saturday. I don't. Yeah. I know. And we, yeah, I blew it again, didn't I? It's okay. It happens. So I suck. Anyway, <laughs> I, I anyway, slept in uh, Saturday anyway, so no, no, no yeah. trouble. <laughs> so, uh, I uh, I just did it now. I, at the beginning, somewhere in the middle of the show, I was showing my stink bug. I still, I still them up. Yeah, I must. I, I missed that. I I did. I get off at uh, well, it's get off work about four thirty Central Time usually. Okay. No. Where is he? Uh, let's see. Where is the M light? There he is. Right there. He's all curled up and he's got his proboscis tucked That's in his cool. legs. But I took the, let's see, where's the other one? Sorry. Uh, there's the one where I, uh, him without his wings, basically. Uh, yeah, look at what. And they started cutting into his body a little bit. And here's what the wings look like over here. And speed, how would you how would how would you like it? How would you like it if a bug did that to you? Yeah, if I were dead, I really wouldn't care. So what if you were alive? Ooh, can I be dissected? I want to be dissected when I die. Take my parts. You mean yeah. after you die? Okay. Yeah, there's the you inner one. Sure that's that. <laughs> yeah. And then uh, here's one of his. I think I got one of his, a couple of his yeah, in there. And I wouldn't mind being a, you know, like one, one of those um, body farm cadavers that the, uh, you know, the forensic science. people always study. The something science. like that. Something yeah, useful. Stuff. Yeah. Something the medical students can learn to do operations and stuff on. Hell yeah. Where'd the bugs go? Oh, I threw them off. Uh, I. I tossed them out. Oh, uh, let's see. And I like I, the patterns on the wings here. You know, I wonder. I wonder. Yeah. I wonder what I, I want. I wonder what happened to Nathan Art. I uh, haven't seen him for a while. Yeah, and, I was just reminded of him. You know, when 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 when, the, when you show your uh, you know your avatar. avatar. Yeah. Well, Nathan and Artwork, the, if you're out there, we miss you, man. And that the uh, Nathan Artworks piece is still the main focus of the uh, intro, too. Yep. Right. Yep. There's a nice yeah, he's a good guy. He's a good guy. Yeah, that does a good job of showing you the patterns on the wings. Mm-hmm. Cool. In the inner wing. But I was going to try to find, I've been trying to find a fresh one on my ceiling, but they finally stopped coming out, or at it's, least it's, slowed up. They're probably uh, right now, like pretty stationary and immobile, hidden in some cracks somewhere. Yep. Temperature temperature gets above about above fifty or so. Though you'll see them start coming out a little bit, and crawling around. Yeah, and that's going to be, you know, I I'd never seen those before this year. They did. We we didn't really have them before this year. They yeah. they, they traveled here over this over the summer. Um, but they. They, I don't know if they just got here. I know they just got to your neighborhood, but I think they got here the year before last. But yeah, it sucks. Yeah, they're gonna be. I can't believe we don't have more ladybugs, though. Yeah, we don't. Don't have a lot. 
in northern Minnesota, my sister had quite a few this summer in, in her yard. And she, had, she had a lot of larvae, which I'd never seen before. And they're really yeah, they're pretty, pretty cool looking. Yeah, yeah. cool looking things. And she had a whole bunch of them. And I, I, I had her actually send me, send me some through the mail because she was finding them everywhere. But not, yeah. not down south here. I don't know. We get so we get them. They they went over winter in some of the corners in my house up in the up on the ceiling. It's kind of cute. Yeah. They all huddle together there and sit there all winter. Well, this year I'm going to make a big effort to find spiders out in the woods, and I may mm -hmm. even have to go out at night. I'm not sure. But. I think PZ Myers is up in your neighborhood. You see, if, you should see if he'll let you come along with him sometime when he goes I'd out. Love, I'd love that. Yeah. <sighs> I was so, thinking about driving out there and having coffee with him. It's about 175 miles, I think. Yeah. So, Speed, I do have a question. I do have a question for you. You know Otang the actual Otangelo's in the chat, right? The 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 real Otangelo? Yes. That, what's your what's your, what's your policy? Us, he's telling us humans live with dinosaurs. Yeah, what's your what's your what's your policy on him again? Because well, he sticks does. If he does anything untoward in the chat, we'll we'll time him out. But if but he's uh, not allowed in my room anymore, uh, so he has been banned until he does a proper apology for the mm. bullshit he pulled. So that's that's the policy with Otangelo. Uh, he is uh, suspect, real suspect. I don't really care for some of the shit he did. So anyway, is that fair? I don't know. Yes. Yeah, in the side chat, I just noted too that if he uh, starts, you know, threatening people with hell like he does or saying inappropriate stuff, then you know, of course, time him out. And well, yeah, as long as he's just out there making hilarious statements like that humans lived with dinosaurs, that's that's yeah. just, that's that's low cow stuff. But but it tips the uh, tips the scale sometimes just uh, out of nowhere, and it kind of can't take takes me off guard i start to be okay with the with the dude and we start getting along all right and then he does something that's like holy fuck what the hell does this one mean fossils tell us that love evolved hundreds of how did what the fuck hold on fossils tell us that love evolved hundreds of millions of years ago helping our mammalian ancestors survive in the time of the, the, the time of the dinosaurs Okay. So, Otangelo, Otangelo, you know what? I'm just going to say it. You're insane. I don't give no, a shit. I love, I love that. <laughs> yeah, you're insane. Wrong with that. All our little mammal ancestors loving each other and the little huddled masses underneath yeah. the, uh, the the bushes and in, uh, in their burrows. Just but I thought Otangelo didn't another. believe in hundreds of millions of years ago. And, okay, I'm confused. Well, so, what he... He did a, uh, a a stupid um, tweet thing earlier where he was replying to Stephen McRae and somebody else about um, atheists have to have faith, and then he named like 17 ridiculous things and then put the word ah, faith Stephen in front of McRae. it. So now I think what he's trying to do is since he can't win arguments, he can't read science journals and stuff like that, he's just trying to make fun of the position. Yeah. Uh, he's, he's he's quoting a pop science article is what he said. Okay, yeah, probably from a pop science article. And there's nothing. Or, and I, and there's nothing again, he misreads with, things too. So disclaimer: there's nothing, there's nothing wrong, wrong with, with pop science as long as you get the actual source. Right. That's exactly. As I read pop science, every time I do yeah. a show, I do. Pop, I read pop science. I am pop science. We all are. I mean, really. Yeah. Yeah, but you're more fabulous. I'm, I'm fab science, yeah. Fab science, fab yeah. Science. yeah. Me, me and Midnight are going to start our own show and call it Fab Science. Yeah. <laughs> oh, you've got something going on tonight, don't you? Me? Bug, yeah. Yeah, it's Monday. I got, uh, what do I got releasing tonight? I got something that releases every Monday night. Uh, something about skin lizards or some uh, uh, legend of skinwalker, right? Well, I, I just I scheduled that. That's not for a couple of weeks yet. But oh, that's a couple what I got weeks, tonight yeah. is about the uh, about the ice worms, the black ice worms, and uh, uh, that live in the glaciers, and Ooh. they're extremophiles. They they only survive in this like uh, on either like on, like ten to fifteen degrees on either side of freezing. Um, the freezing temperature. Dinosaur, dinosaur. I'm sorry, I was. 
I don't see that one. Uh, let me see. You have to do. You, you need to do. You need to do upcoming uh, live streams. Yeah. Oh, no. There's a There's a link in the side chat. Let me drop one in the live chat too. Okay. Wee. Are uh, I'm looking at. Oh, that's not the right one. That's uh, Chrome All. Uh, YouTube. Okay, so that's the one. The upcoming one, I Legend of the Skinwalker. I saw that. That was yeah. that's a bit exciting to me. That's the twenty eighth coming out. Yeah, it's so a ways off cool. still, yes. but right. yeah, all kinds of good stuff going on over there at the Hive. Come check it out. Okay, black okay. ice worm. So I'll put that in. You got that one in private chat yeah. too? It's it's right there. It's on the, up on the screen. It's the one that's the furthest on the right there. The oh. blue one peeking around the corner. Blue one peeking around the corner. The Lost Mysteries of the Black Ice Worms. Okay, it premieres at two hours. Yeah. Okay, there it is. We'll go ahead and try to give you a link to that in the description. Have to watch that. Uh, They're stream of files. They're really cool. They're animals that survive in really extreme hostile environments, and they have uh, unique anatomies and, and physiology and biology and... Uh, Ecology, everything's so unique about them compared to other life forms on Earth because they have to be adapted for a completely, uh, completely unique way of life. Oh, in two hours. Ugh, okay, cool. Yeah, eight o'clock. EST. Well, yep. yeah, I guess. <laughs> <sighs> okay, you know what? Normal people. You want to know what's normal. weird? You. Oh, oh no. Okay. Go ahead. Tell us. What's weird, what's weird, what's weird is that what's weird is that I came in and I'm actually talking rather than just coming in, staying for two seconds and leaving. Yeah, what the hell's wrong with you? Are you high? <laughs> yes. I'm kind of wondering that myself, yeah. Yeah. Maybe a I'm I'm high on life or... though. Not high, you know, like not yeah. high on uh any illegal sub you know, illegal subconscious uh, subconscious. God damn it, I can't speak. Yeah, that, that's good. Yep, yep. Well, I'm high on life. I'm 25,937 days old today. Are we shooting it in the head? I think we're going to shoot it in the head. But uh, has anybody seen Dexter? Or is anybody watching the current season of Dexter? I just uh, I've, seen, it. I've seen, I've oh. seen, I've seen Dexter, so, the original, the original series, and I loved it. Except so, okay, maybe put, season six and seven. Although, so we, should, we should talk about that. Probably after we go on live brain bug, but holy shit, were you a little surprised? Yeah. Well, no I, we, spoilers. Me, I'm gonna leave if you're gonna talk about it. Okay. okay. <laughs> me and my wife both predicted what was gonna happen. Though we knew kind oh, of. Oh, you did. Yeah. Wow. Well, that's... Okay. I feel like I feel like I'm being spoiled without being spoiled. Yeah. Okay. Better, thing. Don't I'll, listen. I'll shut up. Don't listen. <laughs> uh, yeah. Uh, anyway. New blood. Okay. I think we're going to shoot her in the head, guys. All right. Good we night. did good today. We did good. Bye. So, okay. Stay, Stay curious. curious. <laughs> Be good to huh. it. Goodbye, cruel world. <laughs>